I am Carrie Thornburg, and I'm an early childhood specialist at the Ashland Regional Training Center. Lots of times you might see me on Zoom. I'm sorry about that. My voice is terrible, especially on like over the, so I'm sure it will really be bad on this camera. But um, um, just a little bit about me. This is a behavior institute, so I just want to give you guys some context of my, um, my behavior experience. Um, earlier in my career, when I first started, I was really a business major when I was young in my 20s, and I was in economics, and I, when I started in my big girl job, my first one was actually at a foster care agency, um, and we, I worked with children who were at risk, of course, with foster care and their families. Through that, a lot of them, we worked with behaviors, um, and they weren't just family foster care. It was definitely kids who needed the um, more intensive services. Um, through that, I worked a lot with parents and schools, and I became a, um, a regional, uh, a family resource center coordinator, and through the school and did that for a few years. Through that, um, I was the district CPI trainer. Do you, so CPI, do you know what CPI is? Okay, CPI is crisis prevention intervention. So if you do TCI, do you do any intervention, like a restraint training? Any, okay, restraint training. That everybody call it like so a restraint trainer. So for about um, 15, to, about 18 years, I've been the district's um, restraint trainer, and we, we use CPI, so crisis prevention intervention. Um, so with that being said, I had into being a special education teacher, working similar um, to what he was talking about his job. I worked with an EBD class. I don't really like to say that um, an EBD unit because we had, what we did was we had one school, we had the resources to have one school where the least restrictive environment was for, we had, were able to support children who become dysregulated. So some of them were, I worked mainly with preschool, the transition from preschool to kindergarten, and that was kind of my niche, my favorite thing, um, or the one I felt pretty, pretty good with um, uh, from, Kindergarten through second was where I mainly worked, although I did serve all those kids. The reason I don't like to call it a unit, it'd be a unit because it was a, their least restrictive environment. And the support services around the school, all the teachers in the regular classroom were able to support um, the students with dysregulated behaviors. Um, it wasn't like they were in the, they were signed over to me and they were in my unit and they stayed with me all the time. That least restrictive environment changed as they received the support and um, the not anything that they needed the um, just the you know if they were developmentally delayed especially a little preschoolers um, sometimes they just needed to be have exposure to things to be able to be in the classroom um, I was an assistant principal um, at the time and I will say so I just want to give you context about um, I was an assistant principal and then I transitioned to the Ashland Regional Training Center through around COVID time I was excited to be able to support preschool teachers with special education in special education um, in 35 districts. So it's, it is a lot because I feel like sometimes I can't really, I just would want to coach someone and be in their classroom all the time. I have been known to be in a classroom and just be there to observe, but I can't help it. I just like to jump in and do it. And I think um, I've at, that my favorite thing is going into a classroom and being called, they have a Miss Carrie already and I was another Miss Carrie. So they just call me that. So that was mine. Um, but I just want to say, I were at, as a, at the Behavior Institute, um, when I would come to these things, when I would come to trainings, and I would have been in the classroom working with little guys the night, bef the day before, I'd been in the back corner being beaten in the back, you know, hitting in the head, bit, you know, uh, hair pulled, chairs, you know, cleaning up my room because I was told to let them just vent and clean up the room. And then a behavior specialist comes in after weeks of this, and they would say, well, did you try a social story? So I know, and you know, of course I did try the social story. So I'm just saying I know that I have a different, I, I want to be able to, um, what I'm trying to say as I'm, this, what we're talking about today is just kind of tier one stuff. If you are going through a lot in your classroom, which I know some of you are, hopefully this conference at least gives you a break and gives you just a time to reflect and to say, um, and especially um, when I did CPI trainings, I did it all the time. 
every day would be an opportunity to reflect on my practice and at least try something else. So um, even if you get nothing from me today, I hope you had a great lunch. I hope you have, you know, or maybe one thing that you can do um, better or one thing that inspired you. So um, with that being said, um, I want to say one more thing about that. Since I've been talking about this, like emotional literacy and PBIS, I get a lot of, does anyone look at TikTok? Everybody? Everybody. I've been getting this thing where, why I said that was the TikTok I'm getting a lot is, um, you know, the room is a mess and then the specialist comes in and it says, um, did you try a social story? And then it says, five ways to, you know, the, whatever that one is. So I get that one all the time. So, um, but, you know, as just another thing, if you do need help in your classroom, let me know. Do a behavior. Um, just let us know and we can come do an observation and help you as much as we can. And of course I lost this. Um, so thinking about emotional literacy all day, every day, um, it is something, um, you guys are busy, right? You have, you have, I mean you're focused on making sure that your kids are kindergarten ready, which most of the time that means the brigands, right? That's what all your teachers are, fo all your principals are focused on, ever, but we, since the pandemic, with our kids not being exposed to a lot of other kids, um, this group in particular, um, they didn't get a lot of, you know, any kind of services, even hands or first steps, it was virtual. So it was all just um, whenever they could, if they could do it. So the lack of exposure to social situations um, has been detrimental, I think, to this group of, and I can't wait till the day I can't use pandemic as an excuse, but this group that you have in your classroom, and I don't know, has anybody seen a, like a, a rise in behavior concerns? I mean, I don't, and that sometimes you feel like, um, when we were talking about, we talk about the pyramid, right? You know, having a tier one, tier two, tier three. Um, we say, I feel like our pyramids are upside down. We're just dealing and just always focusing on that tier three kid that's tearing up the room and you know you're focused on that tier three kid all the time that putting you know all the other fun stuff that you have in place all the materials getting the lesson giving you know making sure I go into centers and do my five back and forth and all the not just developmentally appropriate practice but all of the um, like Eckers thing you know all the I don't even think anyone thinks about Eckers that much anymore all the quality piece you think about Eckers Oh, okay. Well, don't worry about Eckers. Don't worry. Oh. Well, I mean, Eckers is important. And, and Eckers is the one thing about Eckers, and I value it because there's a lot of things you think about. And it's just, an, you know, you see where you are and you see what you need to go. So, um, and the, it's just based on developmentally appropriate practice. So, um, but sometimes you, I feel that a lot of the classrooms I'm going into, there's, I think one time I got a behavior referral, observation referral for seven kids in one classroom. But the teacher's not able to focus on even the very basics of her room, like getting her schedule where she can move it in, move it down and reflect on it, having all the, the posters to reflect on, all of the, so I think that, you know, taking time to get back to that is important. So Eckers is important because it does lead to a quality environment with a, a developmentally appropriate practices in place that do lead to better behaviors. So, um, but emotional literacy every day and all day, I'm not trying to give you, um, this is not, these are just things you probably already do or you've been so focused on that tier three upside down pyramid like reacting, right? Reacting and not being proactive, you know, just Getting back to thinking, spending extra time on these things might help even if it's just a little bit. So um, we're just going to talk about identifying emotions, understanding them, the importance of expressing them in a healthy way, and just a few strategies um, to foster emotional literacy. On your table, I just have this little, it's just for you to doodle on. If you want to tell me how you're feeling today, you could have felt a couple of these already. Um, and um, lots of times after lunch, she, they didn't give us chicken and dumplings, so it's not too much of the Z guy, because sometimes that, they do like to bring chicken and dumplings in here, or like that chicken casserole. But um, so, and um, hopefully by the end, you at least feel with a thumbs up, or at least if there's just a relief that um, maybe had a good relaxing day. Um, so um, that's just a note-taking thing for you.
Um, so we always like to have quotes, I guess, in trainings. It's, they prompt us to, so we do it. But this was a good quote. When we help children become emotionally literate, they'll be more successful in school and life. And, um, and that's through your lifespan. I mean, from, every, from the time babies, from the time kids are babies, from the, till they're, you know, sitting in a rocking chair crocheting or something, we are always, it's important to have emotional literacy. When you see a baby, just smiling at them and smiling back, helping them regulate, getting calm, patting them on the back, we're always trying to work with them. And it's an ongoing life. I'm telling you right now, I mean, I'm learning how to regulate myself a little bit differently with emotions. You know, we are always trying to teach ourselves and on our emotions, but it's important. Whether you're someone, the smartest kid in the class, and you have every, you know, our, my son, for instance, has the smartest kid in the class, always had everything on time and was a rule follower, a rule follower. He had a, char a time where he never really got to feel disappointment and identify that to himself. And then when he got to a point um, in some things, he doesn't want to try it. I mean, so I didn't, and I talk about this with approaches to learning, you know, how important it is to make sure um, that kids go through those feelings and we work with them on that because no, I, you know, I thought everything was fine and dandy, but the kid was stressed out and he didn't know how to deal with failure. And now he's in college and um, he's, there are times when it's just a little bit stressful for him. And, um, but even in classrooms from preschool to high school, he, he never dealt with failure in the classroom or anything. And um, so he never had to work himself through that. Um, so what is emotional literacy? Um, Stacy and I were talking about this and there were times, you know, you think of literacy, the first thing I think of, I used to think of was books. You know, like I'm going to go write to books and I have books out here and you can take some, you can take them home um, and I'll give you like a little thing for that later, but um, it's not just literacy. Emotional literacy can be, um, it's all throughout the day and it's not, so it's not just naming it and like I said, it's, um, it's the actual, the ability to understand your emotions, the ability to, to listen to others and empath, empathize, empath, empathize with their emotions and ability to express emotions productively. So we expect when our kids come in, kids have big feelings just like we do. I mean, they're, kids have big feelings just like we do and sometimes but we are able to cope with them or at least work with our colleagues a little bit that we can we emotionally we're productive not saying we're always emotionally productive I mean I'm sure there are times when you're thrown everything you have every kid in your classroom you have that one child in your classroom you're really doing everything for but you're you know you're just focusing on him then all of a sudden you have to have your TSG put in and then you're you're coordinator says okay we have a PLC in 15 minutes we have to meet but all you want to so maybe that would be the time you just maybe it wouldn't be productive maybe you went into and started to scream or something or have an argument but sometimes I can be honest I don't always um, my emotions are not always productive like if my kids would keep leaving stuff in the house and then I just blow up on them one day <laughs> so and just like with our kids we give we're trying to give them the tools but they're still not always going to be um, Sometimes they will have times where they're dysregulated anyway. But this is what we strive for. Um, emotional literacy and emotional intelligence. Um, emotional intelligence is kind of the broader, um, they kind of go hand in hand and um, they overlap, but emotional literacy is really um, the stepping stone to emotional intelligence, which um, we strive for high emotional intelligence. So thinking about all of the emotions in a day. Um, so say um, it's Sunday and you're supposed to have a snow day Monday maybe. Did anyone hear that it might snow Sunday? Okay. Everybody in the teaching world has already looked for next week and knows that it might snow Monday. Um, so you, you go to bed and you're like, okay, we looked again. We looked, look, look. It looks good. It looks good. We're going to have a snow day. Now, um, you wake up. You didn't get the call. You look outside, again, just like a couple other of those, you're disappointed. <laughs> or maybe you were so prepared for work for that Monday that you knew the kids were going to be there. You just had something really exciting going on. Maybe 
and you were prepared, and you might, um, you might uh, be happy that you're going to school. So I'm not trying to say that we all love snow day, but I mean, who are we kidding? The snow days are great. I mean, but I at least had to put that in there. Just um, you might be happy that you're going to school because you're all ready. You have this great activity planned. You are going to have an observation, and you're just ready. Do you want to get it over with? And you're just you're pumped, so you're ready. Um, but so you get up, and you've already been disappointed. So you have to get up, and you get ready. And then you're ready, you're on time, kind of. But then you realize you wanted to, you pack up all your stuff, right? All your bags. Um, and I know you guys have a lot of bags at home, rolling carts, right? Because um, you bring it all home. But you go in and you, you wanted coffee and you, didn't, you don't have time to make it because you want to be on time for your observation or getting the kids off the bus. And you don't have time to make coffee. But when you're walking in, you smell the coffee. Somebody in your house actually got up before it, maybe your husband or maybe your roommate or anybody, and you smell it, and then you're so, like that feeling, so you have a new feeling, like you're surprised, or you're just so grateful. I know that if my husband was the one that made me coffee, totally surprised, never would have been, never. I would figure that he did something wrong or something. So then I'd be like mad. I was like, I'd be like, what'd you do? You did something. Um, but I'd be grateful. So you're probably grateful. So you've already been maybe disappointed this morning and surprised and grateful. So you, put, you, dip, you know, fill up your Yeti and you go out and you, you have all your bags in your rolling cart and you have everything, right? So you're ready to go. And you've had a couple NTI days, so you finished some of your work, right? And you finished your work and so you know you're going to have a day with, and not any, you know, you did all your COS and your TSG and all those IEP, all that work, the little stuff you guys do. Um, but you're pleased with yourself. So you're walking out and you're pleased with yourself and so you get in your car and what happens? Well, you have, takes you like three minutes to load up because you have so much stuff that you laminated and cut. But, um, so you get in your car and you turn it on and the gas light's on. <laughs> the gas light's on. <laughs> so, right, because the gas light's on. Um, kind of, yeah, you can see where this is going. The gas light's on. So you're like, oh, cool. So you're, you're feeling just changed again, and you um, are trying to figure out what to do. Okay, well, I don't have anywhere on there, so I'm going to, I'm just going to, how many miles? You know, you click through the computer, and I, it always takes me forever. And, um, all right, I think I have enough miles, as long as it doesn't jump down immediately, which has happened to me. Like, I had 20 miles, and then it goes 10. I'm like, what happened, you know? But anyway, so now you're anxious to drive, but you're going. You're just going to go. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And then when you get there and you make it, you pull in and you're relieved because you made it and you have the rest of the time. So um, that is just how many things that happened in maybe one hour, right? And our little guys go through these things in the morning too. Guarantee they woke up disappointed that they had to go to school, right? Maybe their parents' car didn't have any gas. And, you know, and then so what kind of feelings did that they get them? Because they really want to go to school or um, they didn't have breakfast, and no one was there to have their coffee or their breakfast, and they're gonna be late, so they're stressed because they're gonna miss breakfast. You know, they're real stressed about that. So this is why um, emotional literacy, why we're talking about, what we always should talk about it. And, and it's nothing new to you, and again, I'm not delivering anything new, but just bringing it to the forefront again, that reminding us that all behaviors, communication, and um, you might walk in happy this day, right? But there are lots of days I walked into school, like after I got the, you know, disconnect bill and all the things at the house, and I walk in stressed, and you can read it on my face, and my behaviors might reflect that, and everyone can see it, and that's what we're always trying to look for in our kids. So there were five, um, as far as with mo emotional literacy, um, and sometimes I have to look at notes just so I don't sound too stupid, and I get off track. So the psychotherapist, whose name was Steiner, coined the emotional literacy phrase. And according to him, emotional literacy has five parts. Um, knowing your feelings, having a sense of empathy, um, of course, learning to manage our emotions, and, and that, like actually repairing and being able to repair emotional problems, and emotional interactivity, being able to work with others you know, emotionally. Um, uh, he believes that it, you know, this really forms all of our relationships. And again, baby to, especially as an adult, if you can do these things, you can be successful. 
Um, you don't have to have a Harvard degree or anything, but if you can be able to emotionally interact with others or be positive and be able to work with others, you can do any job. I mean, it helps with your, your working. You don't have to, um, the, you know, there's all different ways that you can just be able to work with people, be a great salesperson, be someone who's, you know, counsels others. You might be a pastor or something, but, you know, being able to work with others because you can be the smartest person in the world, but if you can't do these things, you can't be productive member of society. Um, um, one of the, um, one of the things I think we have on lockdown is preschool, especially, and hopefully is just identifying feelings. You know, we have, identifying sad or mad and um, a lot of you know Lakeshore and all these other places you get all these um, all these posters you can put on the wall and talk about different books you know he is sad um, but there are so many um, grades of emotions that are within sad mad glad happy um, and I have a I didn't want to really put it out now, but I have a, an article I'll hand out in a little bit, and it does have a list of all the emotions we could think of. Um, somebody might not be mad, but they may be aggravated, you know, or you're not, you know, you might not be sad, you're just kind of down, you know, you're not sad to cry. Sad doesn't always mean cry, sad. So when we're identifying emotions, um, you know, taking it to another level, it's almost like scaffolding it, you know, once they understand some part of that one emotion and then really kind of figuring out well is there another word for that and you know that helps with vocabulary and it's still a language arts thing and you know you want to use this stuff cross-curricular this is not something you're doing independently of anything else talking about living it and having an emotion having um, an environment that focuses on emotions can be done cross-curricular um, so labeling emotions, I think one of the things I just wanted to bring to, um, to identify about that is think, not just thinking about the very basic ones, but really trying to find different levels and the grades of those emotions. And um, it actually, you know, having those conversations and adding that vocabulary um, allows children, because I'll be honest, one thing I, people would make fun of me for is I always tried to use big words, but if you teach a child a big word, they'll use it. You know, I mean, if I said, you know, if they're distinguished, you know, instead of, I would always call, use all those big words. And, um, but if I said it, they would use it, no matter, they, I mean, so um, they will, they will learn. If you, if you talk to them, they will learn. Um, but understanding the emotions is another thing. Our little guys, um, and even us, sometimes, you know, I have new emotions, you know, I'm getting older and I'm like, what is that emotion? I mean, I don't even know what that emotion is, but um, trying to have them understand, a lot of our kids, if you think about how they feel about something and they don't know how to label it and can't define it, what would they feel? How, what would they do? Maybe their tummy's like starting to get, um, like they have a, their tummy gets like in knots or something. Or, you know, some of our kids shut down. Um, so that's how they're reacting to it or how they're, they're not, they don't understand it. And that's why some of our kids get dysregulated because they don't understand what's going on. Um, we have to kind of work through that with them. And it's not just something we teach them. And it's not every social story is going to solve. Oh, I told you about that. If you don't have breakfast and, you, you know, this is how you should feel. Um, but understanding our emotions, and we all understand our emotions differently. You know, we, we just have to try to teach our kids and really have conversations about how to understand their emotions. So I am going to turn the page. Um, so we have this little guy right here. And if you looked at this little guy and he's just sitting there, we could probably, how would you think he's feeling? Sad, ma did you say mad or sad? Yeah, mad or sad. Yeah. Scared, he could be scared. Maybe he's tired, right? He could be a tired. And sometimes, um, so all of those things, now we don't have his face, you know, even if his eyes are closed and he has no facial expression, like he's just kind of somber, he still could be mad. You know, he, um, we don't know, if we don't know what the context is, you know, like if, if he was in block center and um, 
his little friend, he was getting ready, you know, he was proud a minute ago and his little friend took that one last block that he wanted or some girl said, I need that and put it. And then he ran over to the corner. We would say he's probably mad or disappointed or uh, I don't know, but maybe if he did something, was at cutting at, um, if, we, if he was cutting and he couldn't cut, you know, he was trying to, and he went back there and he just like threw it down because he, you know, it kept getting, you know, sometimes the scissors just keep going flat on the paper or you can't cut up. Um, maybe that was happening more than once and another kid looked at him, so maybe he went in the corner and he's embarrassed. Um, but this opportunity, of course, is a great opportunity to talk to him about it. But what I've learned also during um, these times, now this is, he's just kind of off to himself. There are times that a child might show that differently. Maybe the child who couldn't cut just pushes the, throws the scissors, right? I mean, I mean that happens. Now sometimes when they're dysregulated like that and they're up here, that's not the time to talk to them. You know, it's, you know, when they can calm down and you take a deep breath and they learn how to manage them, which takes a while and it takes, um, a lot of intentional teaching before, you know, with the whole class or before it happens. But I have had, I've done them, I mean, I've, I'm just going to tell you, I, I could, I, my favorite is telling you all the mistakes I've made. So um, I've been in a situation where someone's dysregulated, not control and throwing something, but I keep talking. I keep talking and trying to tell them what they're doing. Well, you need to do this, calm down, it's not that bad. But things like that, when I'm talking to them, um, and even when they're trying to get you know, you're trying to use your strategies and your social stories, they're not seeing any of that. The best time to, hopefully this dysregulated time doesn't last long, but then immediately when you get back, you're able to work back through the learning moment of it. So tell me about that. Um, but we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but yeah, just looking at this, understanding our emotions and understanding, he may not, not be able to label that um, because we weren't really we didn't know what he was at the moment and he you know a same incident he might seem like he's mad but actually he was just embarrassed you know um, even though I would associate that problem with him being um, mad or aggravated so one of the things I would magically love to give you the sprinkle and say I'm gonna just give you this and everyone will learn express their emotions in a healthy way and even myself so I can't do that. So hopefully just thinking about how important it is for them to express um, emotions in a healthy way. This is not just for Kit. This is for us. Talk. Getting the weight off our chest, have a good old rant, and tell someone exactly how you're feeling. So our guys, our kids that are being are dysregulated and that are, and not just our kids that are dysregulated, our whine, kids who are whining, kids who are standoff, you know, won't participate, kids who run, any kind of um, behavior that we see, it's not always just so big, even though we have those. It's their way of ranting and getting it off their chest and expressing it, but they don't know how to. So that's why this is just as important in preschool, um, working with our kiddos on this as it is, tell me, you know, how many capital letters are there? I promise. And, I, and this is true, most of the kids who have heightened behaviors, are their IQs are up here. I would love to do a study on that. I, almost every one of the kids that I worked with could have been in gifted and talented programs. Over 100, you know, 110s, 120s. Um, once they were able to sit and do that, so if getting the, the kids that are most regulated focusing on this first, you will just, the other stuff will just come. You know, they'll be able to sit, they'll be able to take it in. But I'll, I, I don't know what the correlation is. I'm, I'm not, I don't have like a thesis on it or anything. But I would, um, like he said when he was talking about smartest two kids in the, in the classroom, but could not, they had no social skills, no social skills at all. So you guys having them early um, really, you know, sets the stage for their success, even on the brigands. Um, and I always hate going to that, but it's what you're met, that's what your transition is measured on, right? But you do so much more. Every kid you have is at risk, just based the nature of your job, is at risk with, um, at meets an at risk, or they have an IEP already, or they're transitioning with an IEP. 
but so you have all these kids, but you're still supposed to have them kindergarten ready, which means pretty much what they're supposed to learn in kindergarten, pretty much at the very base. I'm just saying that's what that's what that is. So, um, but if you focus on that, and another thing, just to say you are amazing, the three-year-old you got didn't even potty train. So sometimes I would love to tell the kindergarten teacher, which I love kindergarten, I love kindergarten teachers, but, and I don't love to tell them, I do tell them, and I advocate for a preschool. You get them at three, and they're, potty, they're not potty trained. So I just say, say thank you to the teacher that just had them, because you don't have to change his diaper. <laughs> so, you know, like that's what you guys do. So, um, so just, but thinking about this will hopefully make your day easier, just keeping in mind about how important emotional literacy is or just how important, even if you're doing this already, but then you feel bad taking an extra 10, five, 10 minutes talking to a little guy and having a good conversation about their emotions, but you realize you can't finish that other lesson that you had to do or that one big, you know, you know, the big penguin lesson that you have to do, but making that connection right there saved you an entire day of, could have saved you an entire day of not doing anything. And, but just, valuing, like giving you the control back to you to, to not stress about that lesson plan, that that conversation, this conversation about emotions, this time taken out, focusing on emotional literacy, working with each other, that's what's important. You can catch up on that other stuff later in another way. Um, I get kind of off about because I get kind of like, go preschool. Um, so, um, but what can we do to help them really um, what can we do to help them express emotions? Um, it's not like all the social stories. It's not. It's really just the. You can do those, especially when we're teaching them individually. Um, but just one thing to think about when we're trying to work through that is taking the feeling away from the beha the behavior. Um, uh, trying to separate the two and then help them identify that you feel this way, but the behavior it's. You know, it's not okay to do that. Like, if you feel mad at him for taking your block, you can feel mad. You know, you can feel mad. Yes, you feel mad. But throwing the block at him is not. So separating the feeling from the behavior and talking to them about the difference between that and how important that is. Um, so separating those two things. Um, because you want to validate and relate to that. Okay? I'm going to tell you, you know, I mean, you don't want to say, yeah, I feel like hitting someone with a block, too. I'm not saying that. I mean, I don't mean relate that way. Or I hit, a, I hit my husband over the head with the remote yesterday. I mean, I, I'm not relating to that way, but validating it. There are so many times, again, I've been someone to do this. You got a kid, like a kid, for instance, I'll give an example. You're in center, you're in circle, and you're reading a book, and a kid, the, the attention seeker, the whole time, like this. Does, you didn't even ask the question. You just opened the book, right? You just opened the book, and he, he's crisscross applesauce, ready to go. First, just his hands up. Um, he wants to answer every question, say everything. You have him, but like this, right? Well, he wasn't chosen. You know, for whatever reason, he wasn't chosen for a few times. You know, just mad and upset. Then another kid saw him and says something to him underneath, right? Then the kid gets more mad. And you know, you, you see this happen. Well, then he gets starts to escalate. Well, that would be a moment to validate, you know, he in like he was mad and he said he was upset because of what, but when he told the teacher, she just turned away. You know, she just turned away to kind of ignore it to but sometimes you feel like you have to like smoke and mirror it. So like I don't want to get into this right now, I have stuff to do. Um, but that's a good time to validate his feeling because it just kept escalating and escalating and escalating because he wasn't validated. Now, you're not giving in. Um, you're just saying, I understand you're upset. You don't have to spend time talking about it. We can talk about it later. You know, but taking that opportunity to validate it for five seconds can save, again, more time later. But it's tough. You guys have 20 children, right, in a class. Um, maybe sometimes, do you have two half days? Does anyone have two half days? You do? 40 kids, right? Up to, well, I mean, you can have however many you have. But to take, you have so much to get through a day, two and a half hours, three hours in a day. How many? Three hours a day. And not counting everything you have to do. Sometimes thinking about taking that one extra minute to just validate and talk to, through that thing, it feels like a lifetime. 
Like if you've ever waited at a restaurant and you wait there for a minute, a full minute feels like forever. I mean, it just, like if you're waiting on someone to wait on you or serve you. I used to be a waitress, so we used to have to practice that all the time so that we would get out faster. But, um, but yes, validating and relating, trying to find a way to, I, and I've been said, it's not that bad. He didn't mean that, you know. That's not validating. That's just say, oh, you're overreacting, or just, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. It's not a big deal. Trying to be, trying to really think about when you say, catch yourself saying that. I mean, sometimes we want to say that. Oh, all right, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. You know, just go, just go play, just fine, it's fine. If they come up to you crying or mad or something, it's easy for us to say, just shake it off, just shake it off, just go play. But taking that opportunity, those are emotional literacy throughout the day. Not just say, catching yourself saying it's fine. And if you just say, so no, 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 wait a minute, let's just talk about it. That could be a learning moment for them to regulate their, their emotions. Anybody, not just the one, not just the children that have escal like become dysregulated to the point of throwing chairs or something, but all of our kids need to feel those feelings and get an opportunity to talk about them. Um, because I know when I'm feeling something, I call my friend and I want her to val my or my niece. I want they better she better validate and relate to me to get me through the day. You know what I'm saying? So that better happen, just to so I can get through. Um, uh, showing acceptance of it. Um, one thing um, we don't want to do, or one thing to think about, is when we want to say, "Oh, it's not that bad," right? Um, well, all of the kids have different temperaments and. Someone would be super, super shy, or how they show things. We are just trying to identify feelings, let them feel it, let them figure it out on their own, let them try to figure out how they can deal with it. Um, I might want to just go in a corner and sit. This little guy might want to run in the gym, or you know, this one wants to push against the wall and stamp or jump really fast, but this one wants to go under the table. There's no one way that kids handle their feelings. There's no one way we, we handle their feelings. I might cry like a baby. Um, I, if, some, if I get hurt, I'm laughing. I don't know, that's weird. But I mean, just accepting it, accepting how silly I might be showing my, but that's my temperament. That's how I react. And us understanding that we're not there to give them a, if someone takes the block, this is how you feel, and this is what you do when you're upset, and this is what you're going to do. That's why it's such a work in progress. Then there's no magic, no magic card or book or anything I can give you to say, if this, then that, that's it, you're done, perfect classroom, we're good. That's why, because everyone has their own temperament, learning how to deal with it on their own way. Um, so that's why we have tier one, which are things that work in the classroom for everybody, tier two when we have to show some kids a little bit more, and then tier three when we really have to try to give individual things because they need it just a little differently. Um, and then teaching emotional regulations, of course, when you have all of the breathing techniques, you know, we have those breathing techniques, finding ways throughout the day to teach about jumping or getting some of that big energy out or, I don't know, teaching them how to even laugh really loud or laugh really sh small because your attention seekers might yell and laugh really loud when something happens. Why? Because even if it's shh, be quiet. They got attention, right? But even understanding how to react to that emotion. If you're happy and you're with a lot of people, um, it's okay to laugh, but just try to think about everybody else. And that's a good conversation to have. You know, thinking about regulating. Regulating be too happy. Not, not too happy, but lot big, you know, like your attention seekers. Um, okay, so um, there is, this is just a little, um, just to kind of, it's just a prompt for you guys to kind of think about it throughout the day. Um, I don't even think I have one with me. Um, did I give you one? Mm, sorry. I don't even know what. There you go. Um, so just thinking about this, this is just some things to think about what you do throughout the day. And I'm not saying you don't already do this, but, and if you don't really, if you haven't really focused on this, if you can just think about what you might do in your practice next week, Tuesday after the snow day, probably. Um, but just think about adding one thing to it. You know, when, but when you're in, um, 
different self-directed work or when they're in, you know, when they're in centers, they're just thinking about responsible decision making, where they want to go, who they want to play with, what they're going to do, and they're trying to be self-directed. And a lot of that's guided by all of your efforts in your classroom with your routines and your schedules, right? But that's what they're learning. And the idea is that most of the children after a while, you teach that the first couple weeks. This is my room, this is what we're doing, and um, they become self-directed. Um, no different from the child that's having difficulty with that. You just have to teach them a little bit longer and a little bit more and maybe in a little different way. Um, but throughout the day, um, students practice self-awareness, identifying their feelings throughout the day. Um, uh, and especially with di difficult tasks. I really enjoy the approaches to learning standard. I don't know, in the Kentucky, they added approaches to learning. Just really focusing on how important it is for our little guys and what you're already doing like for them to can finish a task. It's not just the task itself, but perseverance and working through it and all of those feelings that, they, like cutting when they can't cut. I don't wanna do it, just forget it. Well, building up those skills and then just how proud they, opening the milk, right? All of that time, um, you have an opportunity. Now, just forget it, I'll do it. No, but just persevering through, open up, try it, try it, you know, just take, you know, but being able to finally persevere through, just do it, just do it. Or just putting on their coat, because, you know, most time when they get home, it's just dropped on the thing, on the floor, or putting it away. But, you know, really having difficult tasks. And all of the preschool tasks are difficult. I mean, for babies, they're difficult. They don't know anything. I mean, they were just, you know, just thinking about how much development they have from the time they get to you in just those few years, it's amazing to me how much they, they learn in preschool. Um, but celebrating all of that, the difficult things that they do. Um, developing relationship skills, especially in group work. And not just group work and small group work where you have like an activity and they have to do it and for like an assessment, but really trying to focus on those, you know, sharing and um, having partner games and things like that. And of course you have your teachable moments and I won't go too much on those, um, this in particular, but just even sometimes just finding a way, um, just knowing you're going through social and emotional learning all day um, and just being intentional about it is what we were hoping for. Um, so what I gave, and we'll just go through just a couple, and I want you to share. I haven't been in the classroom um, in a couple years, and really, who was really there 2020 anyway, but, um, but um, and it's a new thing, and you've got new kids, but if you guys could share activities that you do while we're talking about these, um, because you will get more from your peers than you will me just going blah, 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 blah. Hopefully I just, my, my plan is just in this you know, hour time that it just sparks something that you've already done in the past that you haven't been able to put in place or maybe something that someone else shares with you. And on the back, it has like different, on the back of that sheet I gave you, there's like a little, the, the one with the um, smiley face. You, if you just get a note, if you just hear something you want and like, or you, it prompts something. But, you know, thinking about how you can incorporate social and emotional learning through all of these times. So arrival and departure. Does anyone have an, and I don't, won't read it right now, does anyone have like a, a something they do for the morning, just talk about feelings or how they're feeling, like any kind of, do you, do, do you want to share? I, I would do feeling songs, you know, that's one of that, that sometimes you feel happy, it's like Molly something, uh -huh. anyway it calms them down, like they get so calm, but they do sometimes, and I'll have them go through the emotions, I'll say, show me happy, show me sad, and we'll act like we're going through all the emotions together, show me excited. And they love it. Like yeah. They get there and be like, let's listen to the feeling song. And if I'm like busy and rushing around, we don't get to do the feeling song, they do feel good. Right. They talk, cause it be, and it's important to them. That's great. That's awesome. They love to sing, and they love to start off their day thinking about feelings and everything. And, and it's not, you know, it's a great way to get the day started. Um, and if, when they like that kind of stuff, I mean, is that when you kind of get together in circle or well, just when they're before, arriving? Like before we go down to breakfast. Oh. Breakfast. Uh -huh. And whenever we were doing that song, I was like, <laughs> the conscious discipline? Up, yeah. yeah. And I'd say, so this one feels how? And they would show me happy, you know? So that's how I introduced the feeling study. Nice. Yeah, I love conscious discipline. That little girl hilarious. Like, she'll go talk to the feeling study because she, sometimes she gets so full of rage. And she'll be like, <laughs> she'll be like, anger, I'm angry because. And like, you can hear her, or, you know, like talking to a muffled voice. Wow. And it really is helping her. 
That's great. Yeah, because but that's good because she sees that somebody like that she is so that she it's okay to be angry. Yeah. That is great. Who has the feeling buddies? Anybody have the feeling buddies? Does anyone else do conscious discipline? It's great. Do you do the whole, like, everything with conscious discipline or just have the feelings buddies? Yeah. That little girl has been really good for her. That's great. Which, and just try, and you probably didn't say, I bet this will work. And I tell them it's not toys. I'm like, these are toys. These are toys. Right. Right. Well, that's that's great. <laughs> kind of like the elf, on, the elf on a shelf, and the elf, yeah. Um, but the, if you ever get an opportunity to do anything with conscious discipline, it's a great um, a great program to have. And there's a lot of pieces to it, even if you just use parts of it. But and I, so you didn't say, I bet that if she talked to it, that she'll talk to anger. It just happened, right? You just had an opportunity, or did you? Uh-huh. I literally would use it myself in front of them. Right. And I'd be like, Miss Amber feels anxious this morning. And I'd be like, anxiety. I yeah. feel anxious because I've got a lot to do. Right. And that makes my chest hurt. And it makes my face look like this. And I would like talk to it. And like she literally mimics every little thing that she sees. Like even the hand washing. Right. She'll go and get that chart and she'll be counting and like doing this. And that's one of the biggest strategies is for teachers to re- to show that they feel that way, and that you. That's one of the. I mean, and that's one of the. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'll be honest. I used a lot of things. I did that myself, especially with classrooms that were tough. Like when I, I would try to have to talk things out to myself, and then they become they empathize with you, and they so. Right. I do it too. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. I know. That's funny. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's funny. All those things are great. And they're good for me, too. I mean, you like them, too. I love the Go Noodle has, like, this melting one. I had a little guy. He would just melt and melt. <laughs> it's just like, those things are great. And once you find one that they work, that works. I mean, it. and again, it's a time I always breathe with them, too. Like, I was like, okay, I need a break. But that's one of the best things is to, uh, you know, validating feeling. Like, I have these feelings, too. Like, Miss Carrie had a bad day, you know, bad morning. I just need a minute. So will you sit with you at me? I need a minute. And talking through that process, okay, I feel good now. So, you know, modeling it is a big deal. Like, um, just we're human, and we feel that way. And I feel angry and, you know, or disappointed. And But that's one of the things. You know, another, um, one of the things is, like, having pictures. Like, as the, if you have a, I don't know if anyone has, when they walk in, they say they're here. I don't know if they have, like, the stick is here or they they, um, just their routine in the morning, put up their backpack, put things like that. But sometimes if you can even just have feelings on the wall and they can take their picture and put it on the wall because it's so busy in the morning. Um, you have a bus come in, like all the kids. And then you have like strangling like parent drop-offs and then you're talking to a parent. So like thinking that you can say, good morning, how are you? How did you feel today? Do you feel great? You don't have that opportunity every time they walk in like a stewardess, you know? Everyone just comes in at once. But if you have a routine, maybe if they were able to just use a picture, even your nonverbal students and even the ones who are more, not as anxious to come in the classroom, you know? Maybe if they were able to just find, like their, take their picture and put it, you know, match it with in the happy column. Or, but then you can, re- if you see someone that's in the sad or, you know, tired, or you can have a conversation with them and validate it as you're transitioning out. Like if it's somewhere and say, I see you feel sad today, or I see you feel tired, or just kind of address it because it's very difficult to have that one-on-one, how are you this morning? And know exactly how, you know, they feel uh, right when they walk in. But if you do that, sometimes you're able to come back and then talk about it later. Um, 
And then uh, there's different things to do for themselves or with other kids. Of course, having a greeter, maybe if when other kids are already in, they can greet, you know, encourage a kid up, up here that can say, how are you feeling today? And then welcome, be the welcome, maybe a job, the welcomer or something. Oh, you're the first one here, you get to welcome everybody. And maybe, and then they're able to, that's the day that they work on um, finding out how they are and then someone would care about how they're feeling. Um, circle time, of course, like different songs are great. Um, and probably this is one of the easiest things with um, books. We have books. I need to know if I have time. Oh. What time am I here to? Okay. I think I only have about five more minutes. Um, so circle time, of course. Um, we have like books and you have songs. Um, center time, different including activities, related books or songs. So I have books here for you and I'm just kind of going to forward a little bit to this because it kind of goes with all these things. Transitions. Do you know that we spend like 15% of our day transitioning and it adds up to days? It adds up to days. Um, so using storybooks. I'm just, we only have like five minutes because, um, so at least I didn't wonder. But um, at your table, you can pick a book to take home. And if you, someone else took a book and you don't sign a book, you can pick one up from another table. Um, but using storybooks are so important. And I said like literacy, but they are so powerful. And I'm not just talking about the, I am happy. I am sad. Every storybook has characters and they have feelings and they have an opportunity to bring that up. So when you're, you know, when you're preparing a storybook on, and you have, you know, like on the back, you say, okay, with this book, I'm going to do this phonics. I'm going to do this, um, this, I'm going to talk about this rhyming word. I'm going to talk about, you know, all the ELA stuff you have to do. I'm going to make sure I say about the spine in the front of the book. And, but I'm also going to talk about and have this social and emotional literacy question or have this conversation. Just prompting yourself to use that. What we have um, as far as the regional training center, um, I'm not sure, has anyone seen this before? So um, if you go to our website, we have this fun thing. That's Jamie, that's me. My hair doesn't, I don't know, I, I, don't, I don't like that. But if, you go into the, if you go into the library, all you have to do is click on library. You will go here. And we have books that are in here. And you can go into a book. Let's see if it'll, you can go right to it. So this is a tool I'm giving you. So trying to help you figure it out throughout the day. Um, you can go to a book and it takes you to a Google form. And we are trying to have these lesson or these activities for you. So if you read the peace book and thinking about self-awareness, what kind of, how can I think about this? They have different questions that you can ask throughout the day. Then we also have, how can you incorporate the peace book in your greeting? How can you, um, what games, how can, what can you talk about in lunch? How does peace, um, how does sharing foster peace? Like, so we're trying to have these activities for you um, so that you can be cognizant or really think about just one prompt during the day and intentional of how you can do that. I have for you um, a sample or this, um, lesson planning form. Um, so you can copy it and think when you're thinking about a book and it doesn't have to be because one thing you don't have is time and but if you can cross anything and you can cross curricular and use anything across all curricular areas then it makes everything just a little bit easier. So so this is the Ashland Regional Training Site, Ashland Region, Regional Training Center. Um, before you go I wanted to show you one other thing. Um, but yeah, so we are trying to build this. If you want to do this as a professional development in your, in like, if you have any professional development days, we can bring books to your school. We can do like work on this and brainstorm because if you have a number of teachers and maybe I'll try to bring it in this area, if we each did one book, if you did a book and you, you'd have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 14 things done and 14 of these for a book that and 14 activities around. So you, the idea is, um, so we can always try and do a professional development and just kind of have fun with looking at books and figuring out planning and, and talking about it and, you know, I, getting ideas back and forth. Um, uh, social and emotional learning um, in liter with literature. 
Um, so we do already have these started. They're not really, the, and the also how we want to especially work through this, um, it's just new to us. Um, but this resource, we're hoping to have the activities at the center together. And then you can, if you don't have the book or you just want to borrow the kit, you can borrow the kit and then bring it back, you know, send it back. Um, so that's just a tool for you I wanted to share. Um, like you go to any of these books and uh, there, you know, you, it goes to, so even if there's an activity, like usually the document, but then we'll try to have the read aloud and then we'll have some support, some things you can print up so that you can laminate it and do whatever you want. So that's what we're trying to do for you to support this work. So like we're just trying to have them filled out for you already. And again, just you might not like that idea, but that's a good idea. And it's just a way to have intentional opportunities when you have no time in a day. And no, we want to help you out with that. Um, it's very important. So I do want to show you, um, I think I'm running late. Nope, one minute. This, I just want to, for your social and emotional health, just to let you know. You can also go into the other one, not the library, but this is the staff lounge. And this is just somewhere, if you need a behavior, if you want to help and just phone a friend, it'll take you to just click on stuff. You can ask us for help for anything if you can't take time to call, but you just want to go in and do that. Um, in the staff lounge, you can do this. You can request this book. If we still have any, you can request the book if you want that book. And we change this up, so if you just are kind of bored and want to fool around, like look around, if you just want to do yoga, if you touch on um, any one of these pictures, we'll give you a quick yoga pose to do. So there's even chair yoga in the back. If you can't leave and you're during nap time, you just want to learn a little chair yoga. Um, this is for you. We're trying to really support you. Um, this, if you just want to use this even in your classroom, if you go to any of these places, Jamie's in trouble. Um, you, of course, um, you can click on any of these and this will take you to a beautiful video of the Aurora Borealis just with soothing music, um, just in one place. Um, like if you just wanna see the beach and have that at nap time, of course you have an ad, um, but it'll take you to the video of just the beach to just for your, just to take some time and think. So th this is just a little added thing we wanted to give to you guys. Um, so in the staff lounge, if you want to, if you know anything, um, I'm trying to think, you pretty much can go on anything and, it, and it's got something. Self-care, so just anything like that. But um, I hope if nothing else that you are able to use the library. Okay, I'm gonna fast forward now. If you, it's 1.45 and we have a 15 minute break. Um, I didn't want that. Um, I do have some of this second step. Does anyone do second step? Okay, we have second step. Um, I had a little kid who was super scared of this thing. and <laughs> He couldn't even do second step in a whole season. But um, we always have that if you needed to, like, um, if you needed a, want it, were interested in another second step and you needed to borrow it from the center or anything, just let us know. Um, flip it is another thing for teaching transforming behavior. Feelings, talks about feelings, limits, inquiries, and prompts. So we can always do a training on either one of those things as well. Um, and that's it for this. Does anyone have any questions?